So, moving on to better anime that we've actually seen all of. Big O2, which we've talked about twice before. We're done with it. We've seen the end. And there's actually a lot there. This show went in directions I didn't expect at all. Well, I expected the direction it went. Oh, yeah, but I didn't expect the magnitude of the direction it went in. I don't know. It seemed about right to me. Uh, I mean, I guess the warning I have for anyone who's thinking about watching the show is that it literally, and I know, I mean literally in a literal sense, pulls an Evangelion. Oh, yes, very much so. The ending is... uh very has many many parallels with the ending of uh, the Evangelion TV. As show. in, there's action going on, and then the show kind of pans back and does the same thing of, "Hey, uh, I use big robots to trick you into watching my show. Now here's uh, the moral, moral. Yep. And then fade out the end. See, now the thing is, is that I I had seen this show maybe four or five years ago. I probably would have had a much better opinion of it. It's just that I've seen so many shows that. Like, they, they, sh- they, you know, they put the moral as the ending instead of after the ending, you know, and they just all of a sudden turn into this huge, like, blatantly meta- in-your-face metaphorical type of thing that it just, it doesn't, you know, do it for me as much as it used to, especially when I, it's pretty much like I've seen it all. So if you do the same thing again, it doesn't, doesn't work well, for Well, at me. least the thing is, the moral is pretty much present in every single episode of Big O2. That is true. It just plays out over and over and over again. So if you watch the first six or seven episodes and you can't figure out where the show's going, you might want to brush up on your uh, plot predicting skills. Yeah, and if you can't figure it out even after the first season of Big O, which I guess I can somewhat understand, if you don't know what's going to happen after like the first two episodes of Big O2, or just the first one episode of Big O2... You know every, you know that's it. Just you know everything then. Because basically every episode of Big O Two does the, it plays out in a different way. It's always the same moral, but it plays out sometimes in a funny way, sometimes in a serious way, sometimes in a weird way, sometimes in a super metaphorical way. But every episode has the same kind of thread of who am I, wh- why do I exist, metaphysical extant kind of philosophy, blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Now. I actually really, really am satisfied with how the show ended, as opposed to Big O One, which I would have killed people if they hadn't continued it. I just view the whole thing as one show called Big O. Yeah, but there's just this, there's a separation where the second half starts like it, uh, kind of like how I view up, where this is the first half, and then, you know, there's the uh, Jupiter Jazz, whatever. And there's the second half. Yep. Only the thing is, Cowboy Bebop. A lot of the episodes had nothing to do with the overall plot, but in Big O, all of them did. But the same, I'm talking about the same kind of separation that Cowboy Bebop had in the two halves, is that what Big O has. Yep. Now, if you if you saw Big O one, and you weren't impressed, and you're just not even considering Big O two. I highly recommend just watch the first DVD of Big O two, in the very least, mm-hmm. because the first episode of Big O two, which we we've mentioned a couple times before, is really really well done and interesting. Yeah, I think there's one problem with Big O is that it sort of misrepresents itself, in that. A lot of people will watch like the first one and be like, "Oh, this is just Batman," you know. Because it kind of is the first one. Yeah, they're like, "Oh, this is just Steam Detectives clone with Batman," and it sort of is. But that's really just the setting and the, you know, the the style and the items used in terms of like the plot and ac- the characters and what happens. It's totally not any of those things. I mean, the first thirteen episodes are kind of just flim. And they're not, there's not really that much to them, except if you watch Big O2 and then you think back to Big O1, it, one, there's a lot more meaning there and you see a lot more. Mm-hmm. And two, it, you, you, you pull the whole anime logic thing because Utena had the same deal. In Utena, which if any of you haven't seen it, weird things happen, like weird anime things. Like there's a magic arena where people fight duels and this, this castle in the sky like falls down on someone, but they don't get killed. And most people watch the show, and instead of thinking, that was fucked up, why did that happen? What the hell? They think, oh, that's just the way this anime is, I'm not going to worry about it. And then at the end of Utena, they're like, they explain like, oh, there was a reason. Why didn't I wonder why there's a freaking floating castle in the sky? There's actually a perfectly rational explanation for it. It's one of those things where they make you suspend disbelief by putting the show on as a fantasy or a sci-fi. But in reality, you shouldn't have suspended disbelief, you know, because uh, 
it was actually real or yep. something. I mean, the Big O is a very unrealistic robot. It's big and it punches things in ways that you really can't do. Mm. So think about that. How could that actually be? Because it is in the show. It happens and they explain it very directly in a very heavily handed way. Yeah, there are a lot of things in the show actually that go completely unex. You know, it's it's weird because they'll always look for a rational explanation for things, and they'll always talk about things in a strange way. And you just you know you think, what the hell are they talking about? You know, what are the rules of the universe this show is in, when the whole time the show is in the same rules as our universe. They're just making you suspend disbelief, you know, and tricking you into doing it when you shouldn't. Yep, Big O One does it really well, but notice even in Big O One, I mean, half the time there's robots fighting, and a quarter of the time there's funny stuff, but a lot of the whole first season, and much of the second season, is just Roger talking to himself. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people just kind of gloss over what he's saying, because it's just, you know, typical meta-philosophy, meta blah, 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 oh, but if you really listen to the words he's saying... That's what the whole show's about. And there's actually a lot there. Because mm -hmm. I'm going to go off on one of my philosophical things because I got a lot out of Big O, too. And uh, I guess a spoiler warning, I'm going to do my best not to ruin the show, but if you really are worried about Big O, too, being ruined for you, you could probably stop listening for at this point because we're not doing any meta bits after we talk about Big O, too. But basically, consider the premise of Big O, too. The premise is that, well, and Big O, 40 years ago, everyone lost their memories, and no one knows what happened in the world before that time. There's no clue. Yet, everyone just got on along with their lives and lived, and played whatever roles they decided to play in the new world. And the people who lived the best were the ones who didn't worry about what happened before, or what came before, because there was really no way to know. Now... That seems kind of weird, you know, you don't know what happened 40 years ago, and it's a very direct problem to these people, and some people can't handle it. But look at our world, the real world, the world we're in right now, meat space. We, we have the same issue, except it just, it's much further into our history. We don't know the history of humanity. We have a lot of theories, but we really don't know what civilizations were, and what happened to them, and where people came from, and what they did, and why we're here now. And a lot of people don't think about it because it's so long ago that the only people who worry about it are philosophers. Because most people, they just think back and they don't really consider the fact that we have no clue where we came from. Well, historians think about it, too. Yeah. And they, they actually figured out a lot, but not Yes, enough. yes. But, like, I mean, they're, I mean, we know, like, I'm not saying, oh, magic, creation, whatever, any of that BS. But definitely there are civilizations that we know almost nothing about other than that they may have existed. Like the Mycenae civilization. Cyclopeans. Yes. We but Big O but Big O did and I really like this is they took that idea that we don't know where we came from and they made it a present issue instead of the point before which we don't know anything is millions and millions of years ago that point is within the lifespan of people who are alive in this world and it forces the whole show is just showing characters dealing with the fact that they can never know where they came from and as Roger concludes, realizing that it doesn't matter because you can choose to be whoever you are or whatever you are. And the world around you is the world around you and you can take it as you will. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I got out of it. And I really like that because it's an, it's an idea I actually hadn't considered before until I saw Big O. No, well, I probably would have gotten more out of it. It's just that... Uh, I've been turned off by seeing the same... It, it's something, you know, it's like seen it before. If it wasn't something I'd seen before... Yep. I, not specifically Big O, but, you know, the same kind of thing. You know, it would have been like, ooh, he, they did something really cool there. But see, I've seen the same kind of thing like 20 times. See, I've seen similar things in that they, they have this kind of philosophical agenda and they use a robot to show it to you or it's a very, you know, intellectual show like this. But I've never seen a show that addressed the specific philosophical idea that Big O addressed before. All right, I guess that's just true. The, just the idea of take the, the fact that we don't know where we came from and make it urgent, make it recent, make it something that you can't just ignore. Yeah. And then take characters and see how they react to it. Yeah, I, uh, I guess I'm not really, you know, the uh, it doesn't really matter which specific idea. It could have been any philosophical idea. I'm just generally turned off by, yeah. you know, 
philosophical ideas. I definitely see where you're coming from. And if Big O hadn't been the specific idea that it was, if it had been the same idea Ava had, or the same idea Escaflone had, or if it had been any sort of rehash of an idea that's just been an anime over and over, I probably would have hated Big O too. It's just that it happened to be about an issue that I hadn't really considered philosophically before that really made me like the show. Mm. Now, if you were mad about the original ending to Evangelion, don't watch Big O 2. You're going to hate the end. It's the same thing, except no one's going to make a movie to explain what happened. Mm -hmm. They don't show you what happens physically, because it doesn't matter. Just like the end of Ava, the robots fighting didn't matter. All that mattered is what went on in Shinji's head. Yeah, see, I used to be, like, all into this stuff. Like, I'd watch Ava, and I'd be like, oh, it was the best thing ever. Or, like, Akira, where, you know, you don't really know what happens at the end. You just kind of, you know, this vague metaphorical thing. And I'd be like, oh, I get it, or I don't get it. But And I would always be like, ooh, it was awesome anyway. Or, you know, something like that. And it would be the greatest thing in the world. And shows that were just kind of, like, you know, normal, where you see what physically happens, and that's that, were kind of like, oh, these aren't as smart as these other shows. They don't do anything for me. But now it's like I've seen I must have seen a hundred shows just like this where instead of instead of having an ending and then a moral or an ending with a moral, they have a moral in place of an ending, you know, like they make the ending all ooh, for fun, you know. And if you go and look at the IMDb top movies list, I don't know if it's still number one, but for the longest freaking time, number one was The Godfather. And I would be like all right, that was a really good movie, but why is it, you know, number one? And why is it still there at number one? It doesn't really, you know, is it really that much better than every other movie? And then I started that thing, I don't know, I've never finished it, I should go back to it, where I was watching every single movie in the top 250 of IMDb. And I saw a lot of freaking movies that were either, like, way out there and artsy, and some that were just way normal. And I realized the reason The Godfather is number one is because it's both at the same time. It's not all, you can watch it and it would just be a perfectly normal, see everything that happens, you know, mundane, unmeaningful plot movie. But at the, other, at the exact same time, it's the most meaningful movie with all kinds of symbolism and things all over the place. But it doesn't make one instead of the other. The end of The Godfather, it doesn't just turn into like metaphorical stuff. You still see what's happening. You look yep. at it and it's, at the end, there's he's in the church, you know, saying, I do, you know, get rid of the devil. I won't do bad things, whatever they do in church. I don't remember exactly what he said. <laughs> and they keep, they, they keep going back and forth between him and the church, uh, you know, for uh, that. And the hitman that he told to kill people, killing people. And it's an action scene, but at the same time, it's as metaphorical and meaningful as you can get. Yep, and as opposed to, say, Evangelion, where the original ending was, literally, they don't show you anything that happens, and it's just Shinji in his head contemplating the meaning of existence. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, if you still uh, haven't seen enough crazy metaphorical endings to, uh, you know, turn you off to that sort of thing, then you'll probably still like Big O too. Yeah, uh, now see, lot. I can ne I never tire of a show that does that, because that's all I'm there for, at least for shows like this. The only thing that tires me, really, as opposed to you, are shows that try to do this, but either do it about a philosophical, con a phys philosophical construct that's boring, useless, or already done to death, or a show that just does it poorly. Doing, it poor doing anything poorly, whether it's you know, metaphorical or not, is just poor to begin with. I mean, I guess Big O2, to me, did this really well. And you, might, you don't realize what it's doing right away, but... I was extremely pleased with the ending, and I'm extremely pleased with the ideas I've been churning about since I saw it. Well, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, you know, I did like the show a whole lot, and it did do what it did a lot better than other people have done. You know, yeah, I see things. where you're coming from. It's just a lot of shows do this, and but it's like it I've seen this a hundred times. You know, okay, you taught me something new. I learned a new philosophy. Woo, <laughs> you know. Well, it's it not comes, like you enlighten me to some great amazingness. Well, see, this know? comes down to the argument Scott and I always have, because I'm very philosophical and he's very uh, pragmatic. And whenever we argue, we always tend to go in the exact opposite directions to the point that we're 100% diametrically opposed on every issue. Because mm -hmm. philosophy is just bullshit. See, to me, philosophy is the only thing that matters.
but it's just talking and words. It doesn't do <laughs> it's not it's not a physical thing. It's not real. What does it matter? See, I stay up at night wondering about the mysteries of the universe. Yeah, and uh and didn't I Big O just tell you not to? Yeah, exactly. That's why I really like Big O because well, it didn't say not to. It said to not worry, but to still seek the truth. Of course, it, it got complicated because, uh, what's his name? Well, didn't uh, you notice that anyone who was seeking out memories got fucked? Yeah, well, so not everyone. So it's actually telling you not to seek out the truth. But Angel found the full truth, and she was fine with it, because the, she realized what it was, and it didn't destroy her. Uh, what's his name? What was that guy's name? The guy in the bandages? Schwarzwald. Schwarzwald. Schwarzwald found the truth and couldn't handle it and died. Yeah. Rosewater found the truth and freaked out, and that was the end of him. Mm -hmm. Angel found the truth and almost freaked out, but then dealt with it. Well, didn't Gordon Rosewater make the truth and made himself forget or something? See, there, there's a, a super spoilers from this point on. Like, if you haven't seen the show, just stop listening right now. Mm -hmm. Seriously. But Rosewater, it like I get the feeling that they the one of the points they made is that at least in this show, because at the end of Big O, like like all of you who saw it it pans back and you discover that the whole world was just a stage. Mm -hmm. Like, literally, stage lights in the sky and machinery outside man manning the stage. And it seems to hint at the idea that an omnipotent being like God couldn't exist because he would. there's nothing to live for being omnipotent and he would create a world in which people could exist and then deny himself memory of doing so, thus allowing people to exist with free will. Mm -hmm. And... That's at least one way to interpret it. And it seems to me that Rosewater is a god who's forgotten that he's God, willingly. And that his son, well, his son was just dumb. <laughs> I don't know what I yeah, can say Yeah, I don't know him. what was up with that. Like, he started out in Big O1 as, like, the mysterious big evil guy. And then towards the end of Big O1, you actually saw him a couple times, and he talked, and he, he was there. And it was just like, hey, how you doing? It wasn't like, whoa, you're the big bad guy. It was like, hey, what's up? And then in Big O2, he was just dumb, dumb as a brick, and out there doing all kinds of crazy stuff, yep. unbefitting of a big evil character like the Emperor or someone. But I realized I like how they did that in the sense that in Big O1, you don't see a lot of Gordon Rosewater. Mm -hmm. And when you see him, or Alex Rosewater, Alex. Alex Rosewater. Yeah, Gordon's the father. But when he's there, he like you see him for a second, and he says something, and he seems very intelligent superficially. And even in Big O too, superficially, he's very intelligent and very wise. Like, he sits there eating fine meals with that pretentious music playing in the background, constantly telling himself that he's doing the right thing, constantly just spouting philosophy that he doesn't seem to understand himself. And Big O too, as you get to know this character more and more, you realize that he's full of shit, and he doesn't know anything. And he's just an idiot who happens to be in a place of power. And mm -hmm. I kind of like how they did that. How there was no villain... There was just one idiot, one senile god, and then a bunch of people trying to figure out what was going on. Well, no, um, what's-his-name was the villain. Um, oh, uh, Alan Gabriel. Alan Gabriel is, was a villain. He was a bad guy. See, I think the reason he was a villain, because I know, Alan, you made a good point. I didn't think of that. Alan Gabriel is really the only villain in all of Big O. Yeah. No one else is a villain. They may do bad things, but they well, don't... Well, Beck started out as a villain, but he unvillained. But he wasn't... I don't consider him a villain. He was just an antagonist. No, I think he was actually a villain in the first, like, episode or two when he first uh, did bad. And then when he broke out of jail on his own in that other episode, he was still a villain. But then after that second time he appeared and he was done for, then he unvillained. See, now here's where I disagree with you. Because to me, Beck wasn't a villain... He was just playing this role, just like Roger Smith was playing his role. Because notice that while Beck did hor tried to do horrible things, he always had this sense of style and this sense of morals. And he never stepped over the line. And Alan Gabriel is the only character in the show that has no morals whatsoever. He has absolutely no compunction against doing anything. And he forces Beck to step over the line, and Beck can't deal with that. And even in the beginning, when Beck does his evil, he's not a villain. He's not the villain of the show. He's just an antagonist and a plot point. No, if, if you've never, when I first saw the show ever, in like the first two episodes, I was like, all right, Beck that bastard, go get him. You know, he was a bad guy. Oh yeah, guy. definitely, Beck that bastard, go get him. But I wouldn't use the word villain. Oh, I would. At least, if, if you only watch the first two episodes of the Big O One. Well, if you watch Big O One, and that, yeah, but if you watch all of Big O One, you'd think Alex is the villain. 
Yeah. Is it, if I watched one and two again, uh, he wouldn't be viewed as a villain because I've already seen the whole thing. But for when I remember that when I watched it fresh, he seemed like a villain right away. So See, I guess to me, because having seen the whole show, the only character I can justify calling a villain is Alan Gabriel. Because he, everyone does what they do for a reason. And everyone who do whatever they do, they believe that they're in the right. Or at least they know they're in the wrong and they've dealt with that. Alan Gabriel doesn't care right or wrong anything. He has absolutely no direction. He's just doing whatever the hell he wants for fun. And whatever the hell he wants tends to involve hurting people. Yeah. He's not even after the truth. He's not after anything. I don't know, you know, it's just you never know what he's thinking is the thing. He might be thinking that, you know, he might have some crazy whack job plan where if he does this and this and this, then he'll somehow get something. But he doesn't ever get anything, so either his whack job plan isn't working or at some point he like his whack job plan fails and he gives up on it and goes crazy, but you don't realize it because you didn't know his whack job plan to begin with, you know, but I don't know. I think, I mean, because Roger Smith was kind of obsessed with memory, and that's what was keeping him down and preventing him from realizing what he was. Mm -hmm. And once he realized what he was, he didn't, like, get rid of the idea of memory. He still cherishes the memories he has. He cherishes the past, looks forward to the future, but he lives in the present, as opposed to living in the past. Alan Gabriel lives in the present, but he ignores the past completely. Mm Mm-hmm. He I, I, he acts he, one moment is completely separate from any other moment in his life. But notice how as Roger uh, like gets better and better and understands what's going on more and more, he it's like when he stops trying to worry about memories, he gets more memories of how to do awesome things with the robot. Yes, the robot is definitely a uh, metaphorical uh, device throughout see, the entire. The, see, that's the good kind of thing is where you have you know the completely mundane action. But you also have the meaning, and it's together in the same thing. Because at first, they did that perfectly. Remember when uh, Angel discovered the studio where she'd grown up? Yeah. That was very much the metaphor and mundane plot going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think if they'd had more episodes and more money, they could have constructed an ending for the whole show that was similar. You know what it is? It's like... They took the easy way out. Yeah. You know what it's like? It's like, you know when you read a book... And you read in between the lines. It's not, you know, they don't actually write down what their meaning is. You're just reading a perfectly normal story, but there's a meaning there, and you have to extract it by thinking about what you just read. But it seems that a lot of these animes that try to, or, you know, especially animes, but also TV shows and movies that try to be meaningful, what they do is they might make you read between the lines the whole way, but then at the end, they just take what is written in between the lines and put it in bold text at the end. And that's what I kind of don't like. I wish I could just read between the lines the whole time and that stupid people would you know, maintain the thing <laughs> where they didn't see anything between the lines. You know? Well, look at the end of Trigun. Uh, all right, I'm going to spoil the end of Trigun. So if anyone who is afraid of spoilers but is still listening, I'm spoiling Trigun now too. But I think that did it very well. Because the, the moral, you know, no killing, whatever, because he doesn't kill knives at the end, is there. And if you read these lines, you can see all the conflict and the fact that he decides he's going to kill knives throughout the entire final fight. And it's not until the very end when he decides not to, but then he doesn't. And they don't do a crazy metaphor or whatever. They just show him carrying knives back to town, and that's the end. Yep, that's uh, a good And if you, pe- if you watch of- the fight, and you watch the expressions on his face... I mean, if you don't notice any of that, you just see an awesome fight and then the show ends. And if you watch his face and you pay attention to what's going on, you get all that other meaning as well. Mm -hmm. But the show isn't ruined for the people who don't get the metaphor, nor is it ruined for the people who don't care about the action. Mm -hmm. And we've gone on really long about that, so I think that's a good stopping point. All right, sure. And that was Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for our opening theme. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com. If you like our podcasts, you'll love our forums. Make sure you visit them. You can send your email feedback to geeknights at gmail.com. And if you want, you can leave us a voicemail at 206-333-1537. Geek Nights airs every weeknight, Monday through Thursday. Geek Nights is recorded with absolutely no studio and no audience. But unlike those other talk shows, it's actually recorded at night.